Hello again, it's wonderful to be with you for another study. Uh, I'm going through the parables and hard sayings of Jesus. I've written books to coincide with the teaching. And we're up to study number 39, so we're in book number four, The Millennial Kingdom. And the book's available from Amazon as a Kindle download or paperback. And it's also available from the uh, Ballot Ministries website, www.ballotministries.org.uk. Well, we're up to the parable of the talents. There's three parables that Jesus tells in answer to a question. I'm going to read the parable of the talents and then we'll, we'll start. But before I do, I've got a definition because there's a word in it that I didn't really understand. Strawed. We'll come across this word when I read it. And it means to throw grain a considerable distance all up into the air that it may be separated from the chaff. So it's to separate the wheat from the chaff. So, uh, you know, the winnowing, it, it, that's another word in the Old Testament, but straw in it is separating the wheat from the chaff. So let's look at the parable. I think I'll read it right through and then we'll we'll see what how it applies to us. And what's the significance in context? Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country. He called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that received the five talents went and traded with the same and made another five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received the one went to dig in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said, listen what he said, Well done, thou good and faithful. This parable's to do with faith. Good and faithful. Why did they call him faithful? Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also that received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. Said the same. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know thee that thou art a hard man. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. There's the word strawed. Where you gather where you've you're not uh, separated the wheat from the chaff. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, here's what is yours. His Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and slothful, lazy, good-for-nothing servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not. So he didn't say, well, you've got me wrong. I, I'm not like that. He said, you knew I want to reap where I've not even sowed and gather where I've not strawed. Therefore, thou oughtest to have put my money to the exchangers, the bank, that at my coming I should have received my own with usury, that's interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him that hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath, this is important, every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant, unprofitable, the other two were faithful, he was unprofitable. That means that he didn't have faith, he had unbelief, which is rebellion. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be wailings and gnashings of teeth. That's an interesting parable. So it's in answer to three questions. We need to get the context if you just turn, 
turn it into this as a one-off study. It, it's sandwiched in between two other parables, the, the ten virgins and the sheep and goats. And it's an answer to a question in Matthew 24, verse 3. The disciples asked the question to Jesus. He just said that the stones at the temple, they said to Jesus, look at the stones at the temple. And Jesus says, don't you know that one stone won't be left upon another? And they said, when will it be? So when's the destruction of the temple? Well, we know the answer to that. It was AD 70, not one stone was left upon another. But they asked two other questions. What shall be the sign of your coming? That's It must have been prophetic because here's Jesus on earth and they're saying, when you're coming again, what's the sign of your coming? How could they ask that? They didn't even believe he'd die at this time. That's amazing. But you see, it's amazing what you say when you're led by the Holy Ghost. And I don't think they knew what they were saying, but they said, what's the sign of your coming? You said, what, when is the end of the world? And then Jesus says the signs of his coming. He takes all Matthew 24. There'll be wars, rumours of wars. There'll be all sorts of things happen when you see the army surrounding Israel. This generation won't pass. And then it ends by saying, and then I'll come in great power and glory. So that's the sign of his coming. He tells them, you'll see me coming through the clouds in great power and glory. And that'll be the end of the world. And then Matthew 25 starts by saying, and then, verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven shall be like. So when Jesus comes again, this is what the kingdom will be like. He's coming to judge. He's not coming to save the world. He's not coming to save the planet. He's not a substitute for Superman. And these superheroes are trying to save the planet. Jesus didn't want, doesn't want to save the planet. He wants to save people. He'll redeem the world, not save it. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like. So when I come again to judge, and he gives three instances, the parable of the virgins, and I've, I think it's quite clear that's Israel, not the church. There's a whole study, if you've not seen it, look at the previous study. And I think I can prove that the virgins are Israel. He's coming to judge Israel first because they were first. And now the second one, I believe it's about the church I'm going to try and convince us. And the third one is about the nations. It's not about individuals. The sheep and the goats are sheep and goat nations, not individual people. It's nations. Let's start and look at this parable. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling in a far country and delivered him unto them his goods. Well, I think the man that goes away to obtain the kingdom is Jesus. And I think everyone, when you go to any Bible college, they'll say, well, it's a type of Jesus. He's gone away. And, and I think all the believers accept that the parable of the talents is about stewardship. Occupy till I come like the pounds. Uh, in the same discourse in Jesus, uh, in Mark's gospel, Mark 13, verse 34, For the Son of Man, so he's talking about himself here, is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch therefore, for you know what time the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or the cock coin or on the morning. So he's talking about him coming again and he talks about the Son of Man going away to obtain a kingdom. So I think... I don't need to bring any more scriptures to prove that point. So so the man travelling to a far country is Jesus and he's going to return and he's going to ask for stewardship. Who did he leave the talents to? And did, who called his own servants? So if Jesus is the one who goes away, who are his servants? Well, I've got some scriptures those who serve God, obviously, Christians. Paul starts his letter to the Romans, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. So Paul called himself a servant. So he was one that Jesus left as a steward. 
called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. 2 Peter 2 verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Christ. Why do they say servant first? Because that's, that's important. They were stewards. A servant has to do what the master commands them and occupy till I come. There's the talents. Get an increase. Jude starts off, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to them that are sanctified. So, so clearly the apostles thought they were servants. Revelation 1, verse 1, those who belong to Jesus are his servants. You don't have to be an apostle to be a servant. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. So the revelation of Jesus Christ is to his servants, that's us, we serve in Christ. So it was stewardship to look after the talents. Well, I need to explain about talents. There were a weight... It was finance, actually. A talent was finance. It was a weight of gold, silver, or metal. And it was a, a round shape. In fact, a talent, it, it means round. That's what it, the word talent means. It means a round because it was a round piece of silver or gold or metal. And we use this in our uh, vernacular sense. We, we say, a, a loaf of bread, we cut it and we say, give me two rounds of toast, two slices of bread. It, it's a, a round. So, because gold and silver were very precious and they made them in round mates. So, so the word talent actually just means an amount of money. It was, a, it was finance. So, in those days, that's what they knew a talent meant. It wasn't like we say, oh, she's talented, meaning she can sing or she can play golf or she can do something. She's academic. She's very talented. They wouldn't know that we used that sense of the word as talents. To them, it was an amount of money, a talent. It was a round of, of gold or silver or, or lead or anything. But it was, fi it was used as finance. I'll just let you know how important it was. It wasn't a denaria, the Greek, you know, like pence. It was a fantastic amount of money. The Old and New Testament, if I value it at today's rate, it was equivalent to 6,000 denaria. And a denaria was a day's wage, so it's 6,000 days' wages. So, if, if say, a, an average day's wage, which I looked up, I don't know what it is. I've been out of the system for years. But I said, what's the average wage for a working great bread? And they say it was £100. So some people earn a lot more, some will earn a lot less. But that's what they said. So that's £600,000, one talent. So five talents would be two and a half million pounds more. So we're talking about vast amounts of money, something very valuable. Uh, 1 Kings 10, verse 14. Solomon, in one year. Now, the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600 three score and six talents of gold. 666 talents of gold. You're talking about billions of pounds that came every year from Solomon. So, very valuable. Do you remember Haman? Haman said, well, I'll read it. This is to destroy all the Jews. Haman wanted to wipe out God's people. Judah, where Jesus would come from, not Israel. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be, be destroyed. This is the Jews in 127 provinces. And I will pay 10,000 talents, a massive amount of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasury. Jesus used talents. A massive debt to forgive, Matthew 18, verse 24. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which showed 10,000 talents. So 10,000 times 600,000 pounds. 
we're talking about a, a vast amount of money and that's balanced Jesus uses that to show how much sin we've been forgiven because the man had been forgiven all that debt and yet he wouldn't forgive somebody else. So imagine me being forgiven every sin, millions of pounds worth of value of sin and I won't forgive somebody for tuppence. I won't forgive somebody a little petty sin against me and yet God's forgiven all my sins I've ever done and ever will do. So God uses it as an illustration of a vast amount of money. So in context, after we've become servants of God, what are we given? We didn't become servants when we were in the world. So th this could only have been given to us when we accepted Jesus because he gave it to his servants. So the talent represents something that was given to us by Christ, not something we have of sell, ourselves. The men didn't have money and they invested it. It was given them from the master. So what's given to us from Jesus when we accept him? That's a, for you to think about. Because we weren't his servants before, so he didn't give us anything. Well, it can't be money, can it? God didn't give us money when we get saved. He didn't give us any commodity. You know, he didn't say, there's, there's a talent, £600,000, Morris. Now you're my servant. Go and invest it. So nobody gets money from God the day they save. So it can't be anything physical. We don't get houses and lands and anything. We promise lots of things, but we don't get them when we save. Jesus didn't give us those things. So it's got to be something spiritual, hasn't it? And we're given to make profit out of it, not to store it or keep it as a gift. What are we given of Christ that we've got to increase, that we've got to be fruitful for? Because increase is fruit, isn't it? The fruit is the excess of the tree. So the profit of spiritual thing is to be fruitful. What have we got to be fruitful with? What has God given us that we didn't have before we were saved? Something for you to think about. When you were saved, what did you have that you didn't have before? It wasn't money. It wasn't the Holy Ghost. It wasn't the gifts of the Spirit, was it? What did you receive? When you received Christ, you received the fruit of the Spirit, the character of God. That's what you received. That's what is invested in you. Not money, not natural talents. They're from birth, and you could use those talents for God. And you could get profit for the kingdom. But this is profit for you because it was personal. This is not winning souls. That's profits the kingdom. If I cast out devils, I, that's profits the kingdom. But it doesn't profit me because Paul said, if I cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead, give all my money to feed the poor, that advances the kingdom. But he said, without the right motive, without love, it profit me nothing. So there's no profit in doing work for God. So all the work you do for God will increase the kingdom, will build the church. But there's no profit for you unless you have the right motive, unless you have the character of God, the fruit of the Spirit, because that's what is invested in you. And it's very, very valuable. And Christians don't value what's been given them. They've got the DNA of God. His seed remains in us. We've got the DNA, the character of God. And it's very valuable, but Christians don't value it. They're still thinking in the flesh. Christians think like the world, that we, we must find out to win souls. So they bring businessmen in to teach us sales techniques to win the lost. We think like the world. We bring entertainment in the church because we miss what valuable and, and given to us. What's interesting about this parable is that the three men were all given different amounts according to their several ability. And it seems like it's not fair. Why has he got ten talents and I've only got five? Why has he got five and I've only got one or two? And it seems like discrimination. It seems unfair at first until we look carefully at it. It said the talents were given according to their several ability. So God had assessed or God assesses what we can handle. That's very important. 
We don't have to increase what we haven't been given. And it differs because we're all different according to their several ability. So he knew what they could increase. So there's no burden and there's no excuse. There's no excuse to not be fruitful because God knows what you can handle and what you can increase. And he doesn't give you what you can't increase. So that's very important. You know, love discriminates. Love doesn't treat everyone equal because they're not equal. There's no equality in love. Love chooses because you choose one. If you love one woman, you reject all the rest. Love's divisive. You have to leave your mother and father who you love and cleave to your wife. You discriminate. You don't love them equally because you, you leave your mother and father. You may go to Australia and marry a woman there and you'll never see your mother and father again. So love divides. Love is divisive. It's very powerful. And so God discriminates. He decides what you can handle. Well, he went away to a far country. But Jesus is coming back to earth. Let me read what uh, Jesus said at the Passover, his last meal with the disciples, the first communion. John 14, 2, 3. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. So Jesus has gone away and he's coming back, but he's going to judge us to see if we qualify. We're now training for reigning. Well, the day of reckoning came for these servants, as sure as it will come to us. So let's see how they fared. Let's see how they've accrued the excess. I need to say that as believers, we have no excuse because we've all, everyone knows the parable of the talents. We've read the New Testament. We know the parable. But have we applied it? Have we applied it to natural talents? Use your talents for God. Well, that goes without saying, but that's not what the parable is about. It's what is invested in us when we got saved. Is put Christ in us. And that's got to increase. We've got to be formed to the image of Christ. We've got to be, bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. We've got to change from the character of Adam to the character of Christ. But many people are fearful. We'll, we'll come to it. So, why believers think that when we die we go to heaven without having to give an account for how we've lived as a Christian and fruitfulness is beyond me. There's too many scriptures from Jesus and from the apostles to think that when we just die, I'll be with God forever. We were talking before the, the study and, and we were amazed how many people are, are frightened to die. Christians, they know they've got eternal life. They know they're saved. There's no doubt about that. But they don't want to die. They're frightened to die. And I think I know why. They sense that they've got to give an account for how they've lived as a Christian. Their conscience troubles them. They know that they've got to face a holy God to account for deeds done in the body, as Paul said. So that's scary. If you've got nothing to show God when you go, it's very scary. Well, I can only think those people listen to preachers who tickle their ears with some sermons they want to hear and don't face them with the truth. But there'll be no excuse. Paul makes it clear. Let, let me read it, Romans 14, verse 10. Paul says, Why do you judge your brother, or why do you set your brother at naught? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, that's not the great white throne. That's not to see if your name's in the book of life. He's talking to people whose names are in the book of life. He's talking to the Roman Christians. So they save the names in the book of life. But he says, why why you set your brother or not? Don't you know you're going to be judged for how you've lived as a Christian? If you judge your brother on 
un unlawfully, you're going to be judged. If you criticise people, you're going to be judged. If you're jealous, envious of people, you're going to be judged. If you're bitter and unforgiving, you're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Not for salvation, but for how you've lived as a Christian, for rewards or punishment. The Bible's full and the parables are full of rewards or punishment for stewardship. So why would we think we could go to heaven and not give an account for how we've lived as a Christian? If you're a servant, you have to account to your master. If you're a worker, you have to account for the boss. If he sends you on a, an errand, you've got to give an account when you come back. The boss will say, well, what have you done? Have you, did what, have you done what I said? Where's the prophet? Where's this? You know, I am amazed how Christians want to float to heaven on a cloud of glory. There's no reality to them. They just think they can praise God and, and live how they want. And that they've got eternal life. And so they have. But they'll miss the kingdom. They're missing the best. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. Here's Paul again to the, another church in Corinth. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. How you've lived, that's how you've acted in your body. According to that he's done, whether it's good or bad, you've got to account for the good and the bad. You'll be praised for the good, but you'll be condemned for the bad. Not to the lake of fire, you're saved. Well, let's look what happened to these servants. The first servant had five talents. He invested and returned another five talents. So what was his increase? It's obvious. 100% profit. He had five talents and he got another five. That's what we all need to get. 100% of what God's got. Put in you. You don't have to get 100% what God's put in me. I don't have to get 100% of what God's put in you. But you have to get 100% of what God's put in you. And he got 100%. So we know that he was happy, the, the master, because of what he said. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful. You've had faith. Why? Because he did what his master said. He went and wasn't afraid. We'll see that the man who got the condemnation was afraid. He had faith. He did what he was told he brought through. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of the Lord. In another parable, it says, be over ten cities. You reign with me. So the second man, he had five talents. And he had another five, he increased by another five talents. So what did he get? He got 100%. So actually, it seemed like the master discriminated by giving a different amount. But actually, the two first two brought the same profit 100%. Can you see, it doesn't matter what you've been given, it's what you increase. So if you've only been given a little and you get 100% of it, God's pleased. He didn't have 10 talents, he only had 5, but he returned 100% profit. So what did he receive? Exactly the same reward as the man who had 10. He didn't get a better reward or a lesser reward. It was the same. If you get 100%, you'll get this uh, proclamation from uh, Jesus. He said the same thing. Well done, thou good and faithful. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter the joy of the Lord. So he had exactly the same. So we can see how wise the master was now to give them different amounts according to their abilities. Well, the third servant was given one talent. No profit. He didn't get two, two talents. So the, ten, the five Ten talents got another ten, hundred percent. The five talents got another five, hundred percent. The one talent man should have got another talent, shouldn't he? And then he'd have a hundred percent. He only had to get one talent profit, and he'd have a hundred percent. But he didn't. He returned the one, so there was no profit. He was unfruitful. He was disobedient. He was fearful. He wasn't uh, faithful. And what did the master say to him? He said, I was afraid. 
See, not faithful servant. I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. He was fearful. And his Lord answered him and said, Thou wicked son, slothful servant. Because the, the, the servant had said, I know you're a hard master. I know you're going to demand increase. Did you know that Jesus is a hard master? Because he's going to demand increase. He's not going to say, oh, well, you did your best. Like the Boy Scouts, dub, 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 do your best, do your best. Jesus isn't, your best is not good enough for God. You know, I remember when I worked, uh, I was manager of a car sales place and the owner taught me how to clean cars. But the first time I, I went, he said, look, I'm going to buy some cars at the auction. There's the materials, clean these three cars. So I wanted to impress him, so I worked really hard. And by the time he came back after a couple of hours, I'd half done the first car. And he looked at it and he said, son, he said, I can see you've worked hard. He said, but it's not acceptable. He says, we don't get paid for working hard. We get paid for selling cars and we can't sell dirty cars. So he said, tomorrow I'll stay behind and I'll show you. And the next day he showed me how to clean and prepare three cars when I'd cleaned half a car in the same time. You see, your effort doesn't get rewarded. It's the sales. We're not there to clean cars. We're there to sell them. So it's not how hard you work. It's what results you get. So Christians are busy running round like a flea at a wedding, as I say. They, they're here and they're at this convention and they're going to this conference and they're rushing around praising God and enjoying it and rushing around. But they're never changing. There's nothing to show for it. Where's the increase? Are they becoming more like Jesus or are they just enjoying, you know, the concert tour, going around following your pop group? They, they, they travel 3,000 miles to go to Pensacola or to go to Benny Hinn or Joyce Meyer, these wonderful people that they, they think and they, they go around and they, they're busy visiting people and encouraging people that they're busy for God and it's all good. But God won't... Look at that. Lord, we've cast devils out in your name. That's wonderful. We've prophesied in your name. That's wonderful. We've, we've done many wonderful things. We've given our body to be burned. We've fed the poor. That's wonderful. But I don't know you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. To work hard for God and not get results is a sinful thing because he said, get increase. Trade with the talent I've given you and get increased. There's no excuse. So Jesus is a hard man when it comes to it. He'll say, well, I give you, what have you done with it? Why isn't Christ formed it? Why are you still thinking like the world after 30 years? Why aren't you like Christ? Why aren't you the light of the world? You've hid your light under a bushel. You're saved, but there's no light. There's no salt. There's no... So this... This man said, I knew you were hard. And Jesus says, the, the master said, you knew I was a hard man. You knew that I reaped where I had not sown and gathered where I had not strawed. Therefore, thou oughtest to have put my money to the exchanges and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. What was, Jesus, what was the master saying? I'm, I'm interchanging Jesus or the master. What he was saying, look, if you were fearful and you couldn't get increase, why didn't you invest, give it somebody else who could get the increase? So that when I, I came back, I'd have my own with a little bit of interest. You know, if you're fearful to get interest, you could pray for somebody. You could support somebody else. I always say if you're fearful to go on the mission field because you might get killed to risky places, well, if support somebody who can say, I'll play your plane fair, I'll, I'll support you. Because if you give a cup of cold water to a prophet in the name of a prophet, you won't lose your rewards. We're talking about rewards, aren't we? So give it to a person who knows how to bring profit. 
it, it goes across the board. It's uh, interesting that, isn't it? If you can't get increase, give it somebody who can. Pray for them. Support them. Matthew 10, verse 41 and 42. I, I, I quoted it, but maybe some of you don't know the Bible as well as I do. So this is what Jesus said. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Wow, you'll get the same reward as a prophet. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man. In other words, if you receive him, if you put people up on their itinerary, and whosoever shall give to a drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, you shall in no wise lose your reward. You've invested in somebody. So, he didn't even do that. He was frightened and he hid his money and he wouldn't even invest in somebody who could get increased. You know, failure is very costly to God. We never talk about failure, do we? But what about wood, hay and stubble? That's failure, isn't it? We're supposed to get gold, silver and precious stones. So wood, hay and stubble is a failure. It's all burnt up. Uh, you can't get a bigger failure than that. You yourself are saved by fire. So you don't lose your salvation, but there's no reward. You miss the kingdom. You know, when we face Jesus, he'll want to know if we've been faithful. And we've all been given a measure of faith, so it's not the same. Ten talents, five talents, one talent. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. And it's just after he's told us to renew our mind, change from the thinking of the world to the thinking of Christ. Don't be world-shaped. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. And the next verse says this, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man, the measure of faith. Have you got ten talents of faith, or five talents, or two talents, or one talent? You've been given something. Paul says, think soberly. What, what, have, what has God given me? What capacity have I got to, to increase my knowledge of God? God sets in the church apostles and prophets and different ones. We've not all got the same measure. It doesn't matter. Don't want to be an apostle because you'll have to get 100% of what apostles should get. And if you're a teacher, you've got to get 100% of what a teacher should get. So don't cover anyone's ministry. Think soberly what has given you, God has given you, because you're going to get a have to get a hundred percent of that well as as well as the recommendation for the man who got the ten talents he was rewarded he was made ruler over many things and told to enter the joy of the lord so that means he's qualified to be over ten cities whatever and the five talent man he produced profit and he was given the same the one talent man returned what had been given. Well, if we didn't know the story, we'd think that the master was pleased with him, not excited, but he'll say, well, you did your best. You've given me the talent back. You've not lost it. He could have lost it, couldn't he? But he gave back what had been given. And the master could have said, well, I wish you'd got some profit, but at least you've not lost what I've given you. Because he thought that if he gave back what he'd been given, it was acceptable. And yet he knew the master was a hard master and expected to reap where he'd not sown. So he's shot himself in the foot there, hasn't he? He should have known because he was fearful. So he didn't say, well, you did your best. You know, our best not good enough. We've got to be fruitful. Do you know what the master called him? And he gave him back the talent. He said, you wicked and lazy servant. That's serious. So there's a cost to failure. Not only was the master disappointed, he punished him. 
and they cast him into outer darkness. Utter remorse, wailings and gnashings of teeth. Uh, it's described as outer darkness in, in many parables. And I need to explain, this is not the lake of fire. It doesn't say they were damned. It doesn't say they were damned. It was outer darkness. Wailings and gnashings of teeth. In other words, it's the opposite of the joy of the Lord. To the faithful, he says, well done, good and faithful, enter the joy of the Lord. But here he said, you wicked and slothful servant, cast him into outer darkness. So it's the opposite of the joy of the Lord. There'll be wailings and gnashings of teeth. I think this is utter remorse because it's, it's like the standing before Christ for wood, hay and stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. All the wood, hay and stubble's burnt up. But he himself is saved by fire, it says. So it's not the judgment throne of, of God. This is the judgment seat of Christ. So it's not to see whether you have eternal life or whether you're damned. These people already have eternal life. So outer darkness can't be damnation, can it? That's a lake of fire. In other words, it's where darkness can be felt. You're outside, you've lost the light. You've got to wait till the millennium's over and stand before God at the great white throne and your name's in the book. Very serious. Uh, there's other scriptures, Matthew 8, verse 11 and 12. It's the opposite of the joy of the Lord. Wailing's not to utter remorse. Oh, I've wasted all my Christianity. I've been a Christian 30 years and I've got I've nothing to show for it. I've run round this meeting and that meeting. I know all my Bibles and all my doctrines, but I'm still no different. I, I, Christ isn't formed in me. I have nothing to show of what God deposited in me. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be wailings and gnashings of teeth. They're outside the kingdom. They're not damned, but they're outside the kingdom. And utter remorse. Why have I, Why didn't I give God more? Why didn't I have faith? You know, many Christians will wail and weep when they, they realise they didn't have faith. They wouldn't increase what God had given them because it's about faithfulness. And you can't be faithful without obedience. Faith and, and obedience are linked. Matthew 22, verse 11 to 14. And when the king came in to see the guests, this is another parable, he saw that a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said unto his sons, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, utter remorse. He didn't have his wedding garment, he was there. And this is what it says the next verse. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. God calls many people, but they're not chosen for the kingdom. They don't qualify. They're utter remorse. I've missed it. I've missed the kingdom. Well, those who were fruitful and brought profit were rewarded in three ways. I'm coming to an end. I'm recapping now. They were rewarded in three ways. Number one, they received praise. Well done, good and faithful. They received more responsibility. I've made you over a few things. And they were blessed. Enter the joy of the Lord. That's blessing, isn't it? This indicated the rule with Christ and his kingdom. The, ones, the one who hid his talent was punished in three ways. Let's read it. Number one, they were reprimanded. You wicked and slothful servant. They lost the kingdom, put him outside. They were destined to be in anguish. So it's equal, isn't it? One were rewarded, one were punished. One had the joy of the Lord, one has utter remorse. One had blessed and praise, the other had recrimination. Well, the unprofitable servant 
even lost his talent, he even lost what God had given him. That's amazing. He said, take it from him, the one talent that he couldn't get into, take it from him and give it to the one who has ten. And in another panel it says, Lord, he has ten. So there's a divine law here. If you're fruitful and get increased, you'll be given more. If you don't bring increase, you're cut off and lose even what you've been given. And Jesus talks about this to his 11 disciples. Let's come to it at John 15, verse 2. Jesus talks to his disciples. And he says this, every branch in me. So these are people who are saved, they're servants. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, no increase. He taketh away, cut off, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it bring, more, bring forth more fruit. So every branch, every one in Christ, every servant of Christ that doesn't bear fruit, it will be taken away out of darkness. You won't stand. Later, Jesus says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you bring forth fruit and your fruit remain so that when you stand before me, you've got something to show for it. It's not fleeting. It remains. You've, you've, you've grown. You've gained the ground. It's no point being like Christ one day and being like the devil the next. You've got to gain the ground. You've got to increase. Your fruit remain. Well, when Jesus comes in great power and glory to set us a kingdom, there's going to be a great divide. He already divided the virgins, those who will uh, be in the wedding feast and those who won't. That's Israel. And now there's a great divide between the Christians because all Christians serve the same master. We can't say that, you know, some servants are, are not serving Christ. The master gave his servants the talents. So these are Christians. These are all Christians. And when we face Christ, there's a great divide. Just like the virgins were divided, so there's a great divide when we face Christ. And you'll see next study, the sheep and the goat, the nations are divided. Some won't even be in the millennium and smite the nations with a rod of iron. Sheep and goat nations. This is the great divide when Jesus comes, the day of reckoning. I don't hear it preached these days. So this parable is about those who reign with Christ and those who won't when he comes. Enter the kingdom, enter the joy of the Lord. Well, this is a serious parable. So if you disagree with my interpretation, that's all right. Consider it because it's serious. If Put your own spin on it if you want. I think I've got the, the truth. But put your own spin on it and, and see, because it's very serious. There's certainly a great division. You know, children can't take responsibility. You can't, children can't reign. You can't get a boy of five and ask him to run the household. You can't ask a, a lad of five to run your business if you're a businessman. He's not mature enough. So how can Jesus take people who've never matured, who are still children in Christ, how can he get them to reign with him? Think about it. They're not mature. They've not grown in Christ. They've not increased. They've got what Christ gave them. They've got salvation. That's all they've got. They've got salvation. They've never increased. They've never grown in the character of Christ. So if you want to reign with Christ, you've got to, what does Paul say? Hebrews, put it aside, the doctrines of repentance from dead work and baptisms. Let's go on to perfection. Leave it aside. You've got your salvation. You know how to be saved. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You've been baptized in water. Let's go on to perfection. No more children tossed toss to and fro. That's one of my favourite scriptures from uh, Ephesians 4. God sets in the church, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the maturity. So we become to the statue of the character of Christ. So we no more 
tossed about like children to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So it's about being mature, increasing the, the amount of Christ you have in you. So we have to mature in the character of Christ because he's deposited in us and it is going to account for it. We're going to have to account for it when he comes. So let me finish with a couple of scriptures, Galatians 4.19. My little children, Paul says, of whom I have travailed in birth again until Christ be formed in you, till you've matured, you're not a baby anymore, till Christ you mature. And Romans 8.29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. So if you're saved, you're predestinated, obviously from the foundation of the world. Why were you predestined? Why were you chosen for salvation? It tells you to be conformed to the image of his son. It doesn't say to win souls, to build the kingdom, to build the church, to be a soul winner. It says to you predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Whatever you do as a ministry, whether an evangelist, a pastor, a help, an administrator, or a pew warmer, is immaterial. You're all predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Well, take the parable seriously. Your inheritance may be lost if you don't bring increase in what you've been given. So let me finish with this scripture from Paul to the Corinthians. Now, if any men build upon this foundation, what's the foundation? That's Christ. He says it in the previous verse, no foundation can be laid except which is Christ. So we're built on Christ. You're a Christian, you've got Christ in you. He puts Christ in you. Now what are you going to do with it? Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold and silver, this is on Christ, this is what you've been deposited. If you build gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay and stubble, Every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it. When Jesus comes, this is, the, this is the judgment seat of Christ for the talents. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which is built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Well done, good and faithful, enter the joy of the Lord. Be over ten cities, reign with me. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but is saved. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as be fire. So this judgment seat of Christ is not for salvation. That's the great white throne. This is to see if you'll reign with Christ. This is for rewards or punishments in the kingdom. So we'll finish there. Have a wonderful week. And the next study is the sheep and the goats. Again, a great divide, but it's the nations. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.